Wow, what a beautiful PS1 game. Check out those expressive, low-poly character models. They really remind me of Mega Man Legends. It's really too bad that the game is only in Japanese. I'm sure many people in the West would really enjoy this game if they had the chance to play it. Maybe we can do something about that. I mean, how hard could it be to modify the text in this simple little game? Hi, I'm Hilltop, and welcome to What It Takes to Fan Translate a Video Game. A little bit about me first. I've created a number of localization patches for classic Japanese video games at this point. I do the programming, translating, editing, graphics, and more. I focused mostly on PlayStation 1 games, but recently I've moved to doing PlayStation 2 games. Now, we're localizing a video game without the source code. We're just changing text around. I mean, it should be easy, right? And fortunately, yeah, it is pretty easy. So with Quick Translate version 1.8, all we really have to do is select our game file, select what language the game is currently in, which is Japanese, then we select our platform, which is PlayStation 1, this is a PlayStation 1 game, and then Extract Text will spit out all the text in the game. After we have translated it, we just hit the Replace Text button, and it puts all the text back into the game. Well, unfortunately, I have to inform you that that, that video was fake. There is no such program that can translate video games for us like that. Unfortunately, we're going to have to do things the hard way. I used the word source code earlier, but what's that really mean? Source code are the original files that were used to create the game. Source code is very easy to understand, it's very easy to modify, and unfortunately, it's highly secret and unavailable. It would make our lives a whole lot easier if we had the source code, but unfortunately, when we're fan translating, we don't. Well, without the source code, what are we going to do? Well, we'll have to resort to hacking the game. By hacking it, we mean figuring out how the game works on its most basic level so that we can trick the game into doing what we want. We'll have to hack its image formats, text formats, its file systems, and more. So where do we even begin? Well, let's look at what files are on the game disk itself. If we put the disk into our computer, these are the files that show up. We have three on the top level. We have that dummy.ta. We have slipus 01934 whatever that is. And we have system.conf. And then we have this folder called data, which contains a bunch of .pack files, whatever that is. Well, we know a little bit about these files. We know that dummy.da is actually a completely blank file that just pushes data to the edge of the disk so that it can be read quicker by the CD-ROM drive's laser. We know that the SLPS01934 is actually the main executable of the game, which contains mostly code. And we know that system.conf contains just some boot-up information that we don't really need to bother with. And then we have all of the pack files, which we really don't know anything about. Through the process of elimination, we've determined that these pack files contain everything that we want to edit. So let's take a closer look at them. Now, I must warn you, we're going to be looking at raw data in a second here. And when we look at raw data, we're going to be looking at it in hexadecimal. So the numbers are going to look kind of funny. Instead of going from 0 to 9, this numbering system goes from 0 to F, with F being 15. So just keep that in mind. When we encounter any sort of unfamiliar data format, we're going to open it up in a hex editor first. Hex editor is a program that lets us view the raw numerical data of a file. So here's a pack file. This is the very top of the file. And we have a bunch of numbers because all data is really numbers at the end of the day. But what, is, what does any of this mean? How do, we, how do we take any of this away? How do we modify this? What are we looking to find? Are there any patterns here? Well, now let's talk a little bit about file directories first. We have a hunch that these pack files, just, just going by their name, are not actually individual files. We, we think that they're actually packages that contain many, many files, aka a directory 
But what really is a directory? I mean, we have folders on our computer, but what? how are they actually represented in an operating system? Well, what if I told you that folders are actually just files themselves? Directories are files that actually just contain a list of files. There are some bits of information that have to be in a directory, like file location and file size, so that each file can be read. There's also other types of information that could optionally be in a directory, like file name and file type, but those don't necessarily need to be there. When we look at numbers on the PlayStation 1, they're going to be kind of reversed. So you see, the PlayStation 1 is a 32-bit little Indian system. So, so we expect numbers like file size and location to be 4 bytes in length, which is 32-bit, and they're going to be stored with their bytes in a reverse order. So they're going to look a little bit funky. Back to the pack. Can we make any deductions about the pack files? We, we've already suggested that this is a directory. We're looking at a directory right now, but in that case, what would any of these numbers mean? Well. As luck would have it, there is a pattern here. If we add up the first two numbers that show up, aside from zero, it actually gives us a number that is very, very close to the third number that shows up. That's very, very interesting. And in fact, this pattern repeats until we get to 180, which is the first number in the list. Now, we said that the numbers almost add up, but why don't they exactly add up? Well, there's a property called data alignment when dealing with computers. Basically, what it means is certain addresses tend to like to be on multiples of a certain number, and on the PlayStation 1, that number is 4. Now, why would it make sense for the numbers to be structured this way? Well, here was the eureka moment. File location and data sizes. It's a directory. Each file is separated by a distance equal to the previous file's size. Because we have this information now, we can unpack all of the individual files that are bundled together within these larger pack packages. When I first tried to unpack and repack the files this way, I ran into a certain graphical glitch. It turns out that some of these entries made no logical sense. For example, they would list a file size or a file location as negative 1. Well, negative 1 doesn't really make any sense in this context. This is what's known as out-of-band data. Negative 1 didn't actually represent a file size or location. It meant something to the textures that were being loaded in. And because I wasn't handling it correctly, the graphics were being corrupted, as you can see here. From these unpacked files, we need to find the files that we actually want to edit. For this game, that includes both text and 2D textures, as well as likely the font. Unfortunately, I couldn't make sense of any of the files that we had extracted. They all seemed like complete gibberish. Why were they like this? Well, it turns out that I was diving into the field of file compression. If a file is compressed, it's going to look like complete gibberish until we find out how to decompress it. Now, why, why do games actually compress their files? There are actually a number of reasons for this. One is to fit more data on the disk. That kind of makes sense. Two, it actually reduces loading times, because the time it takes to decompress a file is actually less than the time it takes to load a larger file. Also, it obfuscates the data so that hackers can't figure out how to hack the game as easily. But we're going to hack the game anyway. Now, hacking uses patterns and redundancies to reduce file size, and I'm going to explain how that works right now. Now, here's a very, very simple type of compression. This is called run length encoding. All this does is look for strings of data that are repeated. For example, if we have this uncompressed data here that has eight A's in a row, and then six B's in a row, and then two C's in a row, what run length enc encoding is going to do 
is change the first eight A's into A8, and then the next six B's into B6, and then the next two C's into C2, so that we have a much smaller file than what we started with. That's compression. Now, what we have here is LZSS. This is a more complicated type of compression. Instead of storing certain bits of data, it stores a location size pair that represents a piece of data. For example, here we have the poem Sam I Am by Dr. Seuss. As you can see here, the second line isn't stored at all in the compressed version. Instead, what we have here are these location size pairs. So instead of storing Sam, what it stores is this location size pair of 5, 3. What this says is go to the fifth character in the poem and copy three letters, S, A, M. And then there's a space. And then there's another location size pair, 0, 4, which says go to the zeroth letter in the poem and copy four letters, I am, I space M. So that together we have the full second line of the poem. A little bit more complicated, admittedly. This is another type of compression called byte pair encoding. What this does is look for certain common repeats of data. For example, it notices that AL is repeated several times in this bit of data, so it replaces that with a special code. Here it has turned them into alpha, and then it repeats this process, turning alpha R into beta, and then VN into gamma. And you can see that each time it does this, the data gets smaller and smaller. But how do we know which version of compression the game is going to be using? How, how do we figure that out by just using the game files? Well, the plan is decompilation. While we play the game in a debugging emulator, we have the ability to make the game halt or stop under certain com conditions. What we can use is what we call a memory breakpoint. So here's the plan. When we use this debug emulator, we're going to look for a compressed file that's loaded from the disk into system memory. Right after it's loaded, we can place a memory breakpoint on it. That means the game will stop right as it begins to read the compressed data. And right when it stops, we're going to be right in the middle of the decompression routine in the game code. In theory, we should be able to then decompile the code that we encounter. Decompilation is the process of recovering not exactly the source code, but something equivalent to the source code that we can use to understand what the game is doing. What we're going to find when we start to decompile the game is 32-bit MIPS assembly code. This is machine-level assembly language that the game is actually executing. We're going to have to turn that assembly code into a higher-level language, for example, Python, in order to use the decompression algorithm to decompress the files. Essentially, decompilation is the process of turning the raw data into code that we can easily understand and work with. For example, what we're seeing right here. Now, I'll briefly explain the decompression algorithm that the game was actually using. Well, it turns out it was using the LZSS method that we talked about earlier. It uses offset and size pairs to represent bits of data that are repeated. You can pause the video here and look at the actual algorithm if you'd like. If we're going to translate the game, we actually only have half the picture right now. We only have the decompressor. When we edit our data, we're going to have to recompress that data to put it back into the game so that the game will read it normally. Now, we don't have that the code we don't have the code for the compressor. We're going to have to recreate that from scratch ourselves. So now we have all of the individual files that are separated and uncompressed. We're now free to try and identify them. Now, unfortunately, the directories didn't list the file types of these files, but we can run these through some programs to see if we have any common matches. Let's check if any of them are images or text. 
Luckily, we had a hit. All of the game's 2D graphics were stored in the TIM format, T-I-M, which is totally standard for PlayStation 1. Because it's standard, we already have many tools for editing and inserting graphics of this type. There are many quirks to these image formats, such as color depth, transparency modes, VRAM, and stuff like that, but it's too much to cover for just this video. Now that we have all the 2D images, we can look for ones that might help us with the text. Most notably, a font would be useful, and we might want to edit it as well. Luckily, we do find the font, but there's something funny about it. Let's talk a little bit about color palettes. You might not think that a highly advanced system like the PlayStation 1 would use color palettes like NES games or Super Nintendo games, but it totally does. The same underlying graphical image can have different color palettes applied to it to produce different color variations. This saves very precious VRAM space. Now, it turned out that the game was doing a little trick with color palettes. If you looked at the font in one color palette, it would look completely different than how it looked in another color palette. How, would, how is this even possible? The way it was doing this was it was using reverse planar images. Now, this explanation is a little bit too complicated for this video, but if you're interested, you could look at the visualizations that I have here. In order to actually extract and edit the text, we have to know its encoding. An encoding is a mapping between letters and numbers. For example, A might be assigned a certain number like 0, and then B would be assigned 1, and so on and so forth. Now, if you start looking up Japanese text encodings, you will very quickly start losing your mind. There are many, many different types of Japanese text encoding, and it's never really clear at first glance what a game might be using. You'll start to look like our friend Charlie Day here if you actually go in and try to figure out all of these different text encodings. At first, I tried to use some of the most common and popular text encodings to search for text. Unfortunately, the game didn't really seem to be using any of them. What we think at this point is the game is using its own proprietary text encoding. Maybe the font could give us a little bit of a clue about it. There's something very interesting about this font image, and, that, and it's that it has 16 rows and 16 columns. What makes those numbers significant? Well, if you multiply them together, we get 256. This number is very important in computing. It's a number of unique values that a single byte of data can represent. So theoretically, each letter of this font can be represented by a single byte. The encoding would go from top to bottom, left to right, and assign a number to each letter. For example, the question mark would be 7b in hexadecimal. Each letter can be represented by a unique value from 0 to 255. But remember, the game was doing a funny trick where it's actually storing two different images inside of the font graphic. This means that one byte is actually not enough space to hold a single letter. The encoding that we're looking for would need to be at the very least two bytes per letter. The last trick that we have up our sleeves in identifying the encoding is relative searching. What it does is it uses an assumption that letters follow a certain order. For example, that if A is 30, B would be 31, C would be 32, and so on. So we don't look for the encoding itself, but just the order of the letters, and have it search up text based on that assumption. Here's Monkey More. It's a relative searching program. We can input our files, the text that we're looking for, and the character set from our font file in order to begin relative searching. Unfortunately, when we do it, we get no results. Well, remember what we said earlier about the encoding being two bytes at minimum? Well, currently we're only searching for a one byte encoding. We can fix that by enabling wildcards and putting an asterisk character between each letter of the text that we're looking for.
And if we do that, we actually get hits. Hooray! We can now analyze the text and begin to write a what we call a table file, a mapping between each letter and its associated number. We're going to be using that table file to actually extract the text. So in these text files that we've identified, they don't contain just text. It contains first a header. The header typically is used to identify where each bit of text begins and ends. In our case, it looks like this. Let's talk a little bit about pointers first. In order for the game to keep track of data like text or images, it needs a pointer to it. A pointer is an address that tells the game where to find a piece of associated data in memory. Well, there are two types of pointers that we're going to find in a PS1 game. The first is what we call absolute pointers. They describe the exact location of a piece of data. The other is, our, the other is called a relative pointer. It describes the location relative to some implied offset. For example, an absolute pointer would be something like John lives at 15156 Translation Avenue. That address doesn't depend on where you are to know exactly where he is. But a relative pointer would be something like John lives three blocks north and two blocks east of here. That instruction depends on where you are currently, hence relative pointer. Now remember, the PS1 is a 32-bit system. If it was using absolute pointers, each pointer would be 4 bytes in length and be actually within a certain range. What we see are actually pointers that seem to be 2 bytes in length and are not in that range. So these are probably relative pointers. Well, here's how the script files are actually being put together. At the very top, we have the number of entries, that is, the number of lines of text. And then after that, we have the actual relative pointers. Each one points to the start of a line of text. Now, you've probably noticed that the entry 288 appears over and over in the script file in the header. Well, it turns out 288 is actually the location of the very first bit of text in the file. But why does it appear so often? Why, why does it appear over and over again? What kind of secret is it hiding? Well, I actually don't know. I, 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 really, I really don't know why the first line of text has so many pointers pointing to it. When we're hacking, we often encounter inexplicable things like that, and we just kind of have to roll with it and not mess with it too much, or else we might break something. Well, we finally know which files have text, how that text is indexed, and how that text is encoding. We can finally put all of the pieces of the puzzle together, and we can finally extract the text. Finally, we have the actual script. You'll notice that in addition to text, there are also what are called control codes. Control codes tell the game many different things. It can tell it when to change the color of the text. It can tell it when to insert a certain profile image into the text box. It can do all sorts of other things aside from just the plain text itself, and that is embedded directly into the text. By messing around with the game's memory while it's running, we can figure out what each tag does pretty easily. Now, when we're actually editing the script, we need to pay very, very close attention to the limitations of the text engine. For example, in this game, text boxes only have three vertical lines and can only hold 16 letters across. At the time, I didn't know how to edit text in a way that would give me more space. That's something I learned later. Remember, Dr. Slump is the very first hacking project I ever worked on. So at the time, these limitations were absolute. We would also need to edit that font file from earlier to add some uh, commas and apostrophes so that we can have the text looking good in English. We can finally edit the scripts. However, we need to pay very close attention when we're editing to those limitations that we outlined earlier. It's a little bit hard to edit text like this because we don't know exactly how this text is going to look when it actually gets inject injected back into the game. Everything up until this point has actually been relatively simple, but actually inje injecting the text back into the game files is the biggest hurdle to overcome in fan translation.
the number of issues that can pop up when injecting text is absolutely monumental. Just because we can extract the text does not mean we can inject it back with no issues. Quite the opposite, actually. So now we have a clear image on how our text injector and build process is going to look like. First, we translate the text. Then we update the relative pointers and the headers of the text file. Then we compress the script file with our compressor. Then we pack each text file into its parent pack file. Then we update the directory entries and the pack file header. And then finally, we can rebuild the game disk. More on that later. Let's look at the other half of translation, the graphics. This game features a lot of Japanese text that is part of the environment and not in the text boxes. We've shown previously how we've extracted these images, but let's see how we can actually edit these images in a way that's friendly for the PS1. We have to be very careful when editing these images. We cannot use any colors that are not in the original image's color palette. If we did that, we could have unintended side effects. Luckily, I have a 14-step process for editing PS1 images. You can pause the video and look at it if you'd like. When we're dealing with very highly detailed pixel art in PS1 textures, we have to take a lot of care in order to re retain the original style. This single graphic took me an entire day to translate, for example. For the release of the English patch, I actually wanted to do something special. If you didn't know, this game is based on a property called Dr. Slump, which is made by Akira Toriyama, the creator of Dragon Ball Z. Now, in the 90s, his comic and anime was rebooted with different designs for the characters, and people typically don't like these rebooted designs. What I wanted to do was replace Arale's uh, default look with the original 80s designs and not the reboot designs. Now, luckily, the original outfit is in the game files, so that's just a matter of swapping some files back and forth, but the hair color is wrong. Normally, we could edit a texture to change the hair color, but that was not the case here. If you look at Arale's textures, her hair is actually not on there, so we can't edit it by just editing a 2D image. Luckily, there's a program called PSX Prev, which is a program that searches for and views file formats that are commonly used in PS1 games. We can check this scan for TMD option for looking for a 3D model since that's the most common one. Luckily, we actually have a hit. We can actually view Orale's 3D character model, but we can't edit it using this program. As you can see, the brown hair is actually part of her 3D model and not her textures. Luckily, we do have documentation on how these 3D models are put together. The hair is being colored through what is called vertex coloring. Vertices or vertexes are the corners of a 3D model. Each vertex is assigned a color, and the mesh or the faces between the vertices is a gradient of the colors that it touches. So here's our plan on changing our hair color. We're going to load the 3D model in a hex editor. We're going to identify the vertices by using the uh, documentation. And we're going to look through and see which ones are colored brown and change those brown vertices to purple. Well, it was very tedious to manually dig through all the vertices, but the end result turned out pretty good. All that's left now is to rebuild the game disk. We have all of the files as we want them. We have the pack files and every individual file that makes up the pack file just the way that we want. The only step left is to rebuild the disk. There is a program called mkpsxiso that we can use to rebuild the game disk. All we have to do is to write an XML file like the one on screen that defines the structure and the directory of all the files on the disk. Because it would be illegal to distribute the full game, we have to create a patch first that transforms the Japanese game image file into an English one. Using Delta Patcher, we can give it the modified and unmodified file and have it spit out a patch. And then we're finally done. We can distribute our patch on the internet and have everyone play the game in English. Finally.
Now, I might have made it sound easy, but let me assure you, I didn't know about any of this when I first started hacking this game. Reverse engineering is the art of looking into things that you have no idea about and trying to figure out how they work. There are no guarantees, there are no guides that you can follow. It all depends on how far you can push your own critical thinking skills to figure out solutions to these very difficult puzzles. I did have one document to help me get started though. The programmer behind the Police Knots fan translation, Slow Beef, actually made a pretty cool document about how he first got started with hacking that game. I'll link it in the description. Thank you very much for watching the video up to this point. If you want to support me and my future translation projects, consider becoming a uh, supporter on my Patreon. I have other videos on how the hacking and translation of Racing Lagoon and Aconcagua were done, as well as a series on hidden content that I found within the files of Racing Lagoon. The link will also be in the description. So how do you feel about fan translation now versus before you saw this video? Would you like to take part in a fan translation project? And then knowing now what it takes to make one? Do you want more videos like this one that go into the technical side of things? Or do you want to see more of the creative parts like localization and writing? Um, I really don't know where to go from here on this video series. So please let me know what you thought of it. And if you would consider watching something like a live hacking stream on Twitch or YouTube. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one, hopefully.